Um, the, uh, the bridge to a carbon-free energy future is going to be paved with silicon. That's pretty common knowledge. There we go. That's actually fairly common knowledge. Um, and we have a technology that stores six times the energy of graphite, which is what we're replacing, using a silicon nanoparticle powder. So graphite has reached its theoretical limit. We are getting no more gains out of a graphite lithium ion battery, period. It's done. It's over, which is why there is so much excitement about silicon. In fact, the national labs, the Enrol friends, um, have created a, a silicon anode committee project that's focused exclusively on trying to figure out how to bridge where we are currently with silicon to where we need to be in the future. And we're actually in very deep discussions with them about our patented core technology. We can't go beyond that. Simple value proposition, we're using two patents that uh, Lorenzo, uh, my chairman and founder, uh, created one at University of Minnesota and another at UC uh, Riverside. Okay, can you salvage that? I'll keep going. We're using a the particular magic is that Lorenzo is focused exclusively on the lowest cost manufacturing, the easiest to process, and is not using any of these super elegant, very sophisticated approaches that our competitors are using. And importantly, it drops into the existing battery manufacturing lines. So the 285 gigafactories that have been built or are being built will not have to make any modifications to their existing manufacturing line in order to use our product. So we believe we've got the lowest cost, most efficient, easiest to scale uh, process that's being created. Simple license, I'm sorry, simple um, business model, produce and sell or license the core technology to existing battery manufacturers or material suppliers, leverage the existing global ecosystem since we do not need to add, change anything to the manufacturing line and target high performance applications to start with. We've done an extensive research on particularly the drone market. We'll go to market, we'll use existing um, uh, uh, connections within the industry, do trade events and, and press events, of course, and use direct sales to target those 285 um, gigafactories. I've got six-year projections, all kinds of different ones. It really depends on how well the core technology does. I've done it at 20, 50, 100 million, uh, and beyond. We'd be a logical uh, target for a PE firm in a, probably about three or four years strategic partner acquisition. We've already had nibbles from some folks in this space or an LBO or an IPO. Um, I've got decades of experience in uh, innovation and new product. I actually won an award from the San Francisco Business Times as the uh, most admired CEO in the Bay Area. Uh, Lorenzo uh, is a well-known um, plasma physicist in this space. So we've got a great start. We've already actually got $400,000 in the bank. We've got 200,000 more coming. We're looking for 250 outside of our current grants so that we can um, set up a lab that our current grants don't enable us to do. So thank you very much. I'm gonna ask Lorenzo to come up to help on the technology conversation. Soon. All right, let's open it up to questions, please. Can you give me a little bit better idea of where in the um, proof of concept or proving it out in a lab or proving it out in the field uh, this new uh, substitute for the graphode, graphite is. Yeah, so have uh, you, thank have you, you for that uh, scale or yeah. just in the lab only? Where is it? No, no, we're, we're beyond the lab. So my lab at UCR has been doing coin cells for 10 years. Uh, we have been shipping materials out to uh, other labs for independent validation. Polaris Battery Lab, very well known in the industry. They do pouch cells, full cells. Uh, Michigan, University of Michigan, has their, they have their own independent lab. So we've been, we been testing materials, we've been sending materials to them for uh, a little bit more than a year. Uh, and we have also started you know, discussions with uh, cell manufacturers down here in Southern California uh, to get to the prototype stage. Our next stage is the prototype stage. Uh, especially right now with SBIR phase one, we want to set up our own pilot scale facility. And the goal is to boost the performance of the material and make enough of the material uh, to really uh, field testing within one year. Yeah, we're actually we're really happy that we got that SBIR one. Um, Forty percent of the people who get the SBIR one 
get the SBIR too. It's a $1.1 million. And we think we've got an inside track to be able to win that as well. No, go, go ahead. No, go ahead. Just what I was going to ask is, so if I understand it, the, the problem that you're trying, trying to solve with this is increasing the, uh, actually the capacity of the battery. Is that correct? So um, what's your estimate on the amount that it would increase? And do you have any sense of what you're projecting that once you're at reasonable commercial stage, what's the additional cost or the cost savings of that? That trade-off seems to be key to the, the whole proposition. Great. Yep. So, uh, so Enroll and others are targeting actually a seventy-five to fifty dollar per kilowatt hour uh, battery, which is about fifty dollars less than it currently is. Actually, it's going it's going the other direction at the moment, um, and they believe that the only path of getting there at the moment is through using silicon. Is your technology at just within the silicon at the end of the day? Like, are you going to be selling this and not selling batteries, or like? I'm that's correct. Like we, just drop we want to be a materials manufacturer and supplier, and that's it. And we've got the manufacturing uh, technology that we need to acquire. It's actually, it's well known. It's easy to scale. Um, and it's actually, we should be able to set it up in, inside of different uh, markets. Is 100% silicon cathode? No. It's an anode. Silicon oh, anode. Sorry, yeah, 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 yeah that's sorry. fine. Yeah. Silicon carbon composite, uh, which sounds simple, but there are, you know, so many nuances to designing the appropriate silicon carbon composite. Uh, you know, our, our approach actually is very similar to the previous startup. It's about scalability. I think uh, it has been shown that you can include silicon into anodes. Multiple people have done that. The question is, can you do that in a scalable and cost-effective way? Yeah. And we believe that our core technology is the path to achieve that scalability and that cost target. So uh, the core technology from the University of Minnesota actually comes out of my PhD thesis. It's about making the highest quality possible silicon particles. Uh, NREL and the uh, you know, national lab network, they are investing in that technology as well. They're setting up their own reactors using exactly the same technology to provide uh, the highest quality powders to all the national labs because they've reached the same conclusion as us that that is the way to go if you want to make a scalable, viable silicon material for anodes. So is, is the, the IP ultimately in the production of the powder? And then, I mean, because like we've talked to some other folks who are taking, you know, this is a big problem, obviously, trying to get that silicon yeah. to the end. No, so we have two core pieces of patent, two patents already. Um, we're bringing a CTO on in August, and one of his jobs is then to start building a picket fence around those. And similar to what they were saying, there's going to be lots of opportunity in the scale-up process to create tra trade secrets as well as new IP. We've got all kinds of different ideas of working on the surface chemistry. And it's actually one of the reasons why we're, we want to work with and plan to work with Enroll in this group is to co-produce and co-patent some uh, new technology coming up. Okay. Because yeah, ultimately what I was trying to get at with that question was just, like, is it the silicon powder? And then if someone else comes up with a different blend of silicon with whatever else, like, is it just about creating a very high quality silicon powder at the end of the day, or is it about actually the, the anode production? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it is about the silicon powder, part A. Right. Uh, we have an exclusive license for the University of Minnesota for, on the process to make that powder. And we have a patent on how to modify that to make a functional anode. Okay. And that's from UC Riverside, from my lab at UCR. Okay. So those are the two core ones. Mm -hmm. And yes, we understand that we need to build on top of that, but that's, that's what we plan on doing over the next year or so. Okay. Yeah, and it, it works with existing anode and, and cathodes. Uh, but yes, over time, there will be modifications to the cathode side of the equation, as well as internal modifications to the anode. Some of those have already been identified, and others, others have not. Um, it's a revolutionary technology and it's creating so much energy that there's not a lot of research yet on the cathode side on how to manage the potential that's there. At least that's, that's my business understanding of what's going on. And how does this material impact um, useful life of the battery as well as the safety attributes of it? Does it enhance it? Does it augment it in any ways? So the safety attributes are, will be the same than, than the current one and I will let him, or better, we don't know yet. Um, so uh, with respect of useful life, uh, you know, that is one of the limitations of all these new technologies. All these new battery technologies, they boost capacity at the cost of cycle life. Uh, we believe we are close to the cycle life that the drone industry wants. And the drone industry is a little bit more, more forgiving than the 
the, the EV, the electric vehicle, they really wanted the thousands of cycles. Uh, we, are, uh, we are at in the hundred and we want to get to the couple hundred so that we can penetrate into the industrial drones. That is our beachhead market. Uh, and so the idea is once we are in that market, then we can keep improving on the technology and eventually get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the technologies that require longer uh, cycle life. Uh, so our business approach is designed to match our technology development plan, which is why we've identified the industrial drone market as the, as the starting point. And we already have some discussion with, with some of the people who, be, who build cells for the industrial drones. I know that the lithium-ion market has been getting a lot of attention for the environmental hazards when it comes to end-of-life management. Like, is there anything different from silicon from that perspective? That is a fantastic question. Uh, I'll be straight up honest with you. Uh, battery recycling is still a very active area of research. I don't think it has really left the university lab yet. Uh, Ju Cheng Guo, who is on our board of advisors, actually is, is heavily looking into battery recycling into, into his own lab. So we are in a position where we want to grab any IP that is centered on uh, recycling batteries. With respect of recycling silicon containing batteries, it's an open space right now. Yeah. It's a very open space. So yeah, that's an unaddressed uh, and, and an area of, of opportunity for us, of course. Cool. Mark, good to see you again. Thank you. Um, my question is around the next milestone. So you've yep. talked about the prototype being next. Yep. Can you, you've also talked about sort of the vision for where this technology yep. could eventually go. Where, where do you expect to be? We want to get, I want to get an MVP by January. That's our, that's our target. And um, if we can get about a quarter million dollars, we'll be able to move into a lab, get through this next cycle, and I believe I will have a um, MVP by January. Talk about the, the proof points that you will have achieved at that. What is, what is, uh, what's the performance of the- So we'll, ha we'll have 150 to 200 uh, cycles out of the battery with a 10% uh, increase in the energy density. And the folks in the drone market are telling us like they would pay 20% more for the drone if they could get 10% uh, increase in battery. Because you, you can imagine some of these are life-saving type, type of focuses. And that the materials market for the industrial drone for us is a $300 million market alone. Okay. Following on the prior question to that about capacity, um, what are the environmental impacts, i.e., the environment surrounding the new battery technology, does that have an effect on the usefulness of this type of energy storage, i.e. extreme temperatures? Uh, so uh, again, based on my humble knowledge, uh, you know, temperature effects, uh, the addition of silicon of these small particles, it should not make things any different than carbon graphite. In fact, it should be easier, they are smaller, it should be less temperature sensitive. That's my expectation. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, those are some of the things that that's, they are on our radar list, and we need to test with some of the external validation labs. You know, uh, you heat it up to 70 degrees, see what happens. You cool it down to minus 20, what happens? We have not done those tests yet. The theory says that it should be fine, but of mm -hmm. course, it's on our uh, homework. Thank you. All right, that's our time. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.